Hello everyone, thanks for joining. Today I am talking with a good friend of mine, Yasmin Mohammed. Yasmin is an educator and an activist for human rights and now an author. And she's got a great new book out called Unveil. It's how Western liberals Liberal. empower radical Islam. Yeah, okay. I was gonna I was gonna mangle that because I was gonna say something about liberalism because we were just talking about that. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, thank you very much for coming on. Yeah, my pleasure. So, okay, I I wanted to kind of focus more on your subtitle and not that I don't want to talk about your story or anything, but I think you might be, you know, you might've talked about it a little much and might be getting a bit tired. Um, but it's just because your subtitle and then your story kind of highlights that subtitle and it, exactly. it goes to show how, you know, your story like shows how that subtitle makes sense. And so if you wanted to go into that and then we can just start yeah. from there. Yeah, that's exactly it. So through this book, it's kind of doing two things. It's telling my story, so it's a memoir. But then it's also through telling my story, it's showing that intersection between Islamism and leftism and how confusing and infuriating that is and how basically what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to speak to people on the left or try to speak to Western liberals because I know that there's others on the left that are like so far gone that, you know, Majid Nawaz calls them the regressive left. Those that are, um, you know, the fully woke. I'm not even trying to talk to them. I'm not trying to reach them. Um, just like I wouldn't try on the far right, I wouldn't try to, to, to convince, you know, full on neo-Nazis or white supremacists either. I'm not, they're not my audience. What I'm, who I'm trying to reach are rational human beings who believe in enlightenment values, who believe in liberalism, and who will be able to recognize that they are not standing by their liberal values when they turn a blind eye to atrocities that happen because of Islam. So they will, they will you know, it back to the same, you know, the, 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 that episode of Bill Maher with Sam Harris and Ben Affleck. I mean, it was exactly that. It's the same thing. We're lamenting the same thing, which what those men were talking about on that episode, um, it started out with, uh, with Bill Maher and Sam Harris talking about how liberals are so loud to condemn atrocities against the LGBT community, for example, but when you start to say, and in 15 Muslim majority countries, you can be executed for being gay, all of a sudden those same liberals, you know, they go mute. They, they all of a sudden cannot speak to that anymore. When they were super loud about, you know, the Christian baker, they have nothing to say about people literally being executed because of the way they were born. So um, it's just a continuation of that, and then it's really just telling my story, my experience of you know having been brought up first generation in Canada, having one foot in that Islamic world and one foot in the Western world, and just you know um, being able to see both worlds and being able to understand the confusion that's going on. And you're like me; you're the same thing. You're a first generation Canadian. And you also grew up in a Muslim household, not as fundamentalist as mine, but you still see this um, confusion in that intersection between uh, liberalism and Islamism. Okay, I don't even see it as a confusion, and I don't call it liberalism because it's not. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know if you read the book uh, Kindly Inquisitors, and I'm talking about this book a lot now. Uh, it it was written in '93, and he wrote uh, Jonathan Rauch wrote it. It was talking about the Christian fundamentalist uh, censorship. Then he also you know, talked about the fatwa that uh, Khomeini did against Salman Rushdie. Mm -hmm. But then he talked about another threat. And he said that the other threat is the humanitarian threat. And it was a lot of the same thing you see now um, because it was in the PC era. And it was, oh, well, we can't have this speech in this college because it's racist. Mm -hmm. And so he called that a humanitarian threat. And this is what it is. It's... It's out of a place of, well, don't you want to fight racism? You know? Mm -hmm. And, yeah, yes, I do. But what you're doing is not fighting racism. Mm -hmm. You know, it's... 
Like, I don't want to fight racism beautiful. at the expense of another yeah. <laughs> victim or minority group. Do you know what I mean? Like, of course I want to fight racism, but that doesn't mean that I'm going to allow people of other races to do whatever they want to do without me criticizing it because they happen to have brown skin. Like, you know what I mean? There's that, That's why I call it a confusion. I mean, this is, I have to make myself clear. When I say confusion, I'm talking about liberals. Mm-hmm. What you're talking about now is, you know, those uh, the other group that I mentioned yeah. in the beginning, the regressive left or the, mm-hmm. the the cult of woke or whatever. I don't think they're confused, but I think that a lot of people in the middle tr- truly are. Yeah, but I think the people in the middle are confused because they see something, they see a policy that says, okay, this is anti-racist. They yeah. don't know where that policy is coming from. They have no idea the background of what something like critical race theory is. And then, oh, it's anti-racist. I'm going to be mm-hmm. anti-racist. And the anti-racist things, well, well, you know, colonialism was bad, so we can't, you know, we can't put these colonial ideas on people that we used to subjugate, right? Mm-hmm. And so they're they're getting sold a very specific thing, and because it sounds nice and it comes in a pretty package, they're not putting much. I don't think people are looking into it deep enough to realize what's going on. I think now. Some of it might be changing because of stuff on the periphery, like it has nothing to do with Islam per se, but like the trans issue, I think, is really pushing that to home. Mm-hmm. But like, I mean, this anti racism stuff, I think that the, the confusion for the average person who wants to be, you know, a liberal or enlightened person or, you know, just believing in basic human rights, they're going to say, oh, well, I want to be anti racist or I want to fight homophobia or I want to, you know, and so. They're, I want to be an anti-fascist. Yeah, and and they're not putting in the effort into finding out what's actually mm-hmm. going on. I, I um, like I think this is part of the problem. Was and I mean I'm I'm guilty of this, but like someone will go listen to like let's say they go listen to you talk, and they might have read your book. They listen to you talk, and you bring up points, and you say, okay, well you know I read this or I heard Sam Harris say that. They're not going to go beyond that. They're going to take those talking points, they're going to memorize them, and it's just rote repetition. Mm-hmm. And I think I, mean, I think that's where something like your book and when you speak, that it's trying to get people to wake up and say, look, do the look research for yourself. I don't think people mm-hmm. I don't think people are taking the time. And No, I agree they're not taking the time, but all I'm trying to do is offer a different perspective. So they're hearing this same narrative all the time. So, I mean, there was some guy on Twitter once that was talking about how we shouldn't speak out against pedophilia because that's just a colonialist Western, you know, that's yeah. us pushing our ideals on these, <laughs> on the noble savages, right? Pedophilia is part of their culture and it's part of their lives. So we shouldn't be telling them not to do that. Like, I'm like, what the fuck kind of low bigotry or bigotry of low expectations? Like that's the most heinous, disgusting thing I've ever heard in my life. Like only only white Western people know that we're not supposed to rape children. You know, like that's uh, those brown people don't know, and we shouldn't push our our ideas on them. Oh god! So all I'm trying to do is 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 have another voice that mm. speaks up counter to those narratives. I know that people aren't gonna. I tell yeah. people all the time, like. Don't listen to me. Don't listen to them. Do your own homework. Mm. Muslims won't even read their own Quran, for goodness sake. Like, yeah, nobody wants to do the work. But yeah. at least if we're out there repeating a different perspective, then maybe they'll hear that too. Yeah, but I mean, like like what you're just saying there, though. Oh, well, they you know they don't know any better. Mm. You know, that is, like to me, that's far more racist. That benevolent bigotry that comes from that <laughs> side <laughs> is mm-hmm. far more racist than, you know, some skinhead or even some totally hick or whatever who is going to call me a packy or a towel head or whatever right yeah like, like grant me the agency to know that i can screw my own shit up you know like yeah you know did it well you know i didn't need any white people to help me screw my shit up i don't need them now <laughs> you yeah. know like, and, and, it, and it bothers me too because the, the skinhead that's going to say something shitty to us because we have brown mm. skin that i don't that person is an idiot you know yeah. what I mean? That person hasn't sat there and thought about it. That person was probably just taught this hate from a young yeah. age, and and that's it. 
But if you've got, like, these people are PhDs. These people are, like, blue tick journalists or whatever <laughs> that are online. You've thought about this. You have a functioning brain in your head, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, you've probably been through some level of academia in your life. Like, you... And then for you to, to, to conclude in the end something so viciously racist, that's why it's more upsetting. Yeah, I mean, okay, and speaking about the academia, there was, because I've been reading a lot of this, just trying to figure a lot of this stuff out. But, and I think we talked about this paper before, um, but it came out in 2000, and it's called The Virtuous Cut, or it came out in 2000 yes. or 2006. Yeah. Okay, and it was... You know, the virtues of female genital mutilation and how fighting against it is a colonial thing because it comes out yep. of, you know, it comes out of colonial theory. It, mm -hmm. And it, it's all this stuff like you were talking about, oh, well, you know, they don't know any better. They're brown people. It's, you know, like they, they say how it's specifically like white ways of knowing, meaning science and reason and logic. And exactly. <laughs> I'm like, what, what the hell do you mean a white way of knowing? No, how is that not the most vicious racism ever? You know. I mean, but honestly, um, think about it. The next time you're speaking to Dave in Wichita from Microsoft Support, and he sounds like Raj from Big Bang Theory, think about. Like, <laughs> 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 yeah, no, but honestly, like, come on, like, but like, this is to me like, I find this so much harder to yeah. deal with, and it's okay, Charlie Kirk really really odious person don't like him don't have much respect him for him whatsoever but the other day he was at, speaking somewhere and he called out some white supremacists and say you guys get out of here we have no place for this blah 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 okay good on him for doing it we can go into the whole backstory did he you know rile them up or whatever I, I, you know but that little thing he was good it's easy to say okay you guys over here with the swastikas and the skinheads and you know yeah. it, but it's so hard to combat like and I, and I see you do it, and I just—I mean, I just you know, like I have to give you so many kudos for that because I don't think I have the patience for what you do there, because I mean, you're, but I mean, it's like, you know, like oh, we want to cordon off these people that want to fight racism because they're the extremists. But it's like, you know, like yeah. how do you sell that? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I mean, it was. <laughs> remember, okay, so in Islam, the Sirat al Mustaqim, right? The the the, yeah. the, the the narrow path. Yeah. I joke, and I've been joking, and it's just like okay. Oh, you know, when you followed Islam, you only had the one. Now we've got to juggle like what seven or eight. You've got the woke one. You've got the red pilled one. Yep. You've got the, you know, yeah, you know, the white supremacist. One. I mean, it's yeah. You know, I know. And you put like the more restrictive one on top. So if you fall off, you get to a less restrictive one on the. <laughs> <laughs> it's, the it's the seven levels of hell. No, but no, but I mean, okay. Honestly, like, I don't know how you don't get frustrated. Like, I, know, oh, yeah. I, I, I know you do. Of course do, I do. Did I, you see my latest tweet right now? <laughs> I don't know if you saw my latest one, but, you know, somebody started off with, if you're saying that you know, hijab is uh, forced on women, are you trying to tell women that they shouldn't wear hijab or whatever? And I just said, you know, nine times out of ten when somebody starts a tweet with, if you are saying... Yeah. The latter part of that tweet is going to be something they freshly picked out of their asshole. Yeah. I'm tired of it, Obeyed. I am tired yeah. of repeating myself over and over and over again. Of course I am. But I'm feeling like the tides are turning and people are starting to see, people are starting to, people are starting to feel like they can say the basic truth. Things that they have been feeling things that they know to be true, but they have been forced to shut their mouth because if they speak out, they're being told they're Islamophobic or they're being racist or they're being bigoted or whatever. Now people are starting to recognize that they can speak out against these things because feminism, human rights, all of these things, these are universal. These are not Western. You know, We have been sold exactly what you were just talking about before, this bill of goods that these are all Western ideals, you know, which is disgusting to me. But we were we were sold that, and so then we're told you cannot criticize any other uh, cultures or any other religions unless they are Western. That's why they'll speak very loudly against the Westboro Baptist Church for being fundamentalist Christian, but they won't speak out against any fundamentalist Islamic ideologies. And so now people are starting to recognize 
whether it is Islamic, whether it's Christian, whether it's Hasidic Jew, whatever it is, I don't care what your skin color is, I don't care what your ethnicity is, I don't care what your geographic location is, right is right and wrong is wrong, and these are liberal enlightenment values and we're going to speak up for them, regardless of who we are speaking to and regardless of the person, the skin color of the person who is speaking. Yeah. Okay. And I, I really feel like tide, the tide is turning, and so that's why I keep going. No, I, I, I think it is to some extent, but what I'm really afraid about is an overcorrection because I see the brewings of it on the right. Like that thing I mentioned with Charlie Kirk, you know, there is a fractioning off on, call it the alt right, or, you know, they're, they're calling it the new right or whatever, but there's, there's like the fractioning off of. So there was Young Americas for Freedom and then America First, these two groups that were putting on a lot of events together. Now Young Americas for Freedom, which was like Turning Point USA and stuff like that, so Charlie Kirk and Candace Owens, they've separated themselves from the other ones and saying, no, no, those are the far-right bigots. And then they've included people in that who were you know, speakers at their events. So that's happening. And there is that going on there, and I'm afraid of the overcorrection from this woke nonsense. But this woke nonsense now too, like it's Wait, getting. Explain to me the overcorrection, because it sounds to me that like what Charlie Kirk and Candace Owens by separating those guys, I don't, I don't know, I don't see the problem with that. Okay, they're separating, but that they're separating a little bit. But I also think Charlie Kirk and Candace Owens are not as extreme as like like the the people that they're separating from. They're like the white supremacists. They're the people who would like march down to Charlotte Charlottesville, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. That. Th- the opposite side of that is Antifa. Like okay. Charlie Kirk and Candace Owens, the opposite side of that is a you know, SJW, you know, who's gonna yell and protest and say stupid things because yeah. and so but they're not gonna dress up in black again, covering their yeah, face yeah, and, yeah, 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 whatever. But so Candace Owens and Charlie Kirk, I can see them getting some if like the SJW side of it falls down, I can see them getting some ascendancy because I do see that you know, in like some campuses and stuff where groups like that are getting some more traction so i would hate to see like an overcorrection going that way and then if you have an overcorrection going that way you will have that far extreme of it getting a little bit more powerful than what antifa is now compared to the sjw's i think in proportionality i think the right would be worse than the left in this like if you go the other way um Mm -hmm. but like uh getting back what you were saying with the western values I've been harping on this for a while now too, and like most recently, like the free speech thing. Oh, free speech is a white supremacist tool. It's just, you know a tool of the white man. It's like okay, you can go back to quotes from okay, argue whether Socrates is white or whatever. You know, he's Greek. They could talk about swarthy, you know, Mediterranean men. So like, <laughs> so whatever, he kind of straddles the line. But then you go to like you know the so-called golden age of Islam, but the thinkers that were around then. There's a quote from Ibn al-Haytham, and there's a quote from, and then you take a look at John Stuart Mill, mm. about a thousand years apart, and they both say the exact same things. Mm-hmm. If you're looking for the truth, read the arguments from the other side, not just your own, and read mm-hmm. it from the experts. Look for the best argument. I mean, you can show over and over and over again, yes, these values have been around. You know, there have been pockets in time when people have, you know, picked them up. And to say they're just Western, it's it's stupid. You know, mm-hmm. I, 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 it's like the term Judeo, Judeo-Christian. I mean, it's kind of silly. It's around. We use it. You know, it's, and, it's not only silly, but it ends up becoming dangerous yeah. when you have a generation of people that are taught that they are only to criticize Western values, and they're not to criticize other cultures and yeah. other groups, because then what they see. What they what they're basically essentially doing is they're telling them only the Western world can progress because that's how progress happens. It's through criticism. And so when they look at things like FGM or when they look at things like child marriage and they make excuses for it because they're not allowed to criticize non-Western things. Do you see what I mean? How that has become dangerous? Like if they don't recognize that not raping children is not a Western value, that's a human value. You know, not yeah. cutting off your daughter's clitoris with a razor is not a Western value. That's a human value. 
when they start to see us all as human beings and not separate us into Western and non-Western, then they can start to feel empowered to speak up for these values. Oh, yeah, yeah you know, I, I think I maybe just didn't express myself. I was agreeing with, like, I don't think we should think of them as Western values. And I think another problem it has is if you want to inculcate a spirit of those values in the Middle East now or, you know, Muslim countries, you can't keep referring to them as Western values because the West would not have had these values if, you know, you know, part of the reason the West has them is they were Arab thinkers and Persian thinkers that were writing about this stuff and that knowledge came into Europe when the Mongols sacked Baghdad, right? And so, you, you, if we just keep saying that this is these are Western, Western values, like, okay, secularism in the Middle East it's got a really poison, you know, like the term is poison because they think secularism, they think of Saddam, they think of uh, Gaddafi, they think of Assad, right? They, they, you know, oh, look what happened with Mossadegh. You know, like, like secularism to them does not have a good connotation. So when you say Western values and you're saying Western secularism, the average person might think, oh, great, you want to put another dictator on. <laughs> right. You know? Yeah. You know. I do want to say, though, just as a little caveat here, that the reason why they are referred to as Western values mm -hmm. is because the West is the only part of the world that's actually living by these values. So, um, well, even though it, they should be universal, mm -hmm. they are not, they, they, they're only being exemplified in the West right now. But, but I do agree that obviously these are, these are human, human mm -hmm. rights. And maybe that's why we always prefer to say enlightenment, yeah. um, which still gives it the American connotation because they're the ones, you know, Basically, they're spearheading it. They're, the, the progress is, like, if you're talking about feminism, LGBT, mm. equality, anything that you mentioned, yes, it's being spearheaded here in the West, if not specifically in America, but probably not because it's happening in, in Europe and all over mm. the West. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's only for the people in the West. It, it should be for everybody, but... Yeah, I think also giving it that title makes anti-Western people be against the values that would be best for them, you know? Yeah, I mean, and then they drone on about, oh, this is stuff from old white men, and they, you know, and they start quoting Marx. It's like, pardon? Mm -hmm. you know, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, what was Marx? <laughs> yeah. But, okay, I know this is not really kind of in your book but there it's something that bugs me and i don't know if you've seen it and i don't get a lot of it i'm not anyone you know I, i'm not worth the hassle of going after um but x like i started calling it ex-muslim took fear where yeah. like one ex-muslim will tell you oh you're not being an ex-muslim properly and like yeah. or like i mean i know i see you get some of it but i mean you might even get it just for your book like oh you're gonna oh well, you're not doing that right because you're gonna stoke right-wing hatred or you're not doing this you're like well i think i've seen i mean it's kind of hard to say that to me just because i wore a club and i was <laughs> married to a jihadi and i yeah. went to islamic schools and i even taught in islamic schools no no, no so so, so, sorry I, walked uh, the walk. I, I don't mean that way i mean like one ex-muslim telling another ex-muslim how to be an ex-muslim yeah uh -huh. i've seen that with um with our friend Nick, like people have said to her, you know, you have white skin and blue eyes, so mm. therefore you you can't speak to the ex-Muslim experience the way we can because you've, even though she's born and raised Muslim, right? Like yeah. her mother is the one that converted. Yeah. She was never, you know, she's born into Islam just like the rest of us. Um, mm. But yeah, I think that it's, there's no one way to be anything right like a lot of ex-muslims choose not to speak out and i understand that and that makes mm -hmm. sense and that's their they're looking at, out for their own safety and then then there's other muslims other ex-muslims that tell them the fact that you're not speaking out makes you a coward and mm -hmm. i don't agree with any of that like i think that if you can you do what you can do and what you need to do and what's best for you and you don't owe anything to anybody and there's no one way to be <laughs> there's no one way to be an ex-Muslim, just like there's no one way to be an atheist. That's another thing people say, right? Oh, you're an atheist, therefore X, Y, Z. No, therefore nothing. Atheist mm -hmm. just means that I don't believe in any gods. That's it. It doesn't mean that I believe in anything. It's just telling you what I don't believe in. 
Yeah. No, because I mean, I, I, I get it sometimes. Okay, I don't even get it to like a, a big extent. It's just, it's stupid things. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, well, you know, shouldn't, and not that I do, but oh, you shouldn't listen to right wing media. I'm like, why not? I mean, I left all that because I didn't want to be told what I should listen to, what I shouldn't yeah. listen to, what I should say, what I shouldn't say. You know, I know you've been, you're, you've got your book and you're going around talking and stuff, but like, where else are you going to be here anytime soon? Or are you going to be speaking more? Or? Yeah, so I just did Dave Rubin's show, and so his episode will be coming out, um, like, December 9th. Mm-hmm. And then in Vancouver, I'll be at a, a conference called, uh, <laughs> it's Court, C-O-R-T, the uh, conference on recovering, oh, the conference on religious trauma. Uh-oh. Um, so that's in April. And then I'll also be going to the Seattle Atheist Church in in January. Um, also be speaking for CFI, the Center for Inquiry. Mm. So there's lots of stuff on the go. Okay, um, the Seattle Atheist Church. What the hell is that? Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> so they are a group that realized that yeah, okay, we walked away from religion, but we missed community and just. So they actually meet on Sundays. Um, it's kind of like the purpose of UU, which are the the Universalist Unitarians, yeah. where they just take everybody who yeah. was disillusioned with their own religion, and they just have this big, huge kumbaya. Like, doesn't matter if you're atheist or whatever you are, you can just be join this group. And you know, we have potlucks and we have you know whatever it is, mm-hmm. community events. Um, but it also allows theists as well as atheists. So the Seattle Atheist Church is just a group of people that are all atheists and uh, they just want to get together and have that sense of community that you lose when you walk away from your own community. Yeah, okay. I mean, sounds quite neat. It was just, I'd never heard the term atheist church before. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> like, it seems kind of oxymoronic. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm going to ask you to give you one last pitch for people getting their head out of their ass and thinking clearly. <laughs> okay. Oh, just okay. So one last pitch for people getting their head out of their ass. Oh my gosh. How do I? How do I say this <laughs> concisely? Um, I think that essentially, if people just, when you look at a situation, don't look at the skin color or the ethnicity or the religion of the actors in that situation. Just look at the situation itself and then that's how you make a judgment based on your values and then decide whether you, what, how you, to decide how you think about this or how you feel about this or how you want to respond to it or if you want to criticize it or not. That you just look at the actual actions themselves. So one of the things, another thing that I just wrote about today was um, in my conversation with Sam Harris, we talked about this a lot. And Sam talked about how when women or, or young girls are part of a fundamentalist Christian cult and, you know, there's five girls to every man or, you know, whatever atrocities are going on in that cult. We never sit and question and argue and say, these girls made that choice. This 10-year-old girl made the choice to marry this 50-year-old man. We don't make that argument when it comes to Christian fundamentalists. We immediately understand that these kids have been indoctrinated into this and they have made the choice to subjugate themselves based on, you know, Stockholm Syndrome or basically, for me, the reason why I made a lot of those choices was just fear, fear of burning in hell for eternity because you actually believe that that is the truth because you're being told it from as far back as you can remember. So if we just judge, you know, whether they are young girls in Afghanistan or, or in Saudi Arabia or in northern British Columbia or in, you know, Wichita, it doesn't matter human beings are human beings and if we can just start to accept that regardless of the skin color of the people or regardless of the of the specific flavor of religious indoctrination 
humans are all going to respond in the same way. Stop acting as if Muslims are this completely different species of human, specifically Muslim women are this different species of, of woman, and they're going to be the only kind of women woman that says, no, 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 hijab is empowerment and I love it and blah, 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 and we believe them. But when you have a, a fundamentalist Christian woman talking about being empowered by, you know, whatever it is, subjugating herself to her husband or um, wearing her Mormon underwear, then we're not going to say, yeah, that's, that's an empowered choice that she's making. We're going to understand that she's talking from a place of a, a person who's been indoctrinated into fundamentalism. All right. Well, thanks, Jeff. Yeah. I mean, okay, you said a lot better than I did because all I would, all I've ever said on that was, you know, stop, you know, start seeing the victims for the brown people. Yeah. yeah no, that's a perfect <laughs> statement. And also the the other one that you just said earlier too, which was the benevolent bigotry. Yeah. I mean, um, those were really good ways of, of yeah, clarifying I, that. I, I repurposed. I think it was a Dawkins thing. I'm not sure, but um, you know, it's good to have open societies. But let's not have them so open that we let our own principles fall to the wayside. Right. Uh, you know? Yeah. Anyways. Yeah. Um, thank or you. Let's not be so open-minded that our brains fall out. Oh, seriously. That, 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 that's the thing. It was just, well, thank you very much. Um, it was really fun talking to you. Always is. And um, if you want to, actually, if you want to let people know where can people can find you, and then I'll put all the links in the in the description. Uh, you can find me on Twitter, Yasmin Muhammad. You can go to my website, yasminmuhammad.com. You can purchase my book, Unveiled, uh, How Western Liberals and Power Radical Islam, available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and your wherever your favorite bookstore is. Oh, cool. Barnes & Noble's picked it up. I didn't know that. Yeah. Congrats. Yeah. yeah. Any bookstore that you go to, you can request it from them, but or even... Request it from your library too. Encourage them to put it on their shelves. Please help me out. <laughs> this is I'm self-publishing, so I don't have any marketing team or anything behind this. I don't have any large publishers, so um, I need your support with uh, getting the word out. All right. Well, once again, thanks again, and thank you, everyone, and I'll be back.